I'm going to open in prayer, and we'll get started for this evening. Father, we're so thankful for the, the gathering. We're thankful for our time this evening that we get to look at yet another book at a snapshot view. Um, Lord, we're thankful for the richness of your revelation to us in so many forms, in so many genres, and in so many ways that we can learn about life through the lens of truth that would otherwise be hidden to us, that would not make sense. So we thank you for this book that we'll look at tonight, Philemon, and ask that, uh, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm just asking for your grace. <laughs> uh, we need your help and your Spirit's work to bring your truth alive, to have it have gravity, to have meaning uh, in, in what we read and what we see and what we talk about and what we um, draw out of this, Lord. We ask that your Spirit would be at work to just enlighten us of your glories, of your gospel, and the work that you do to reconcile people to you, sinners to you. And uh, so help us tonight, help us to enjoy our time and our fellowship as well, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, tonight we're looking at Philemon. Um, we're continuing in our 66 books series um, each Sunday night, getting a chance to look at a high-level view of a book. Um, not to teach everything in it, of course, but to grasp it, to understand what the book's about, where it fits into the canon of Scripture, where it fits into history, what themes it contains, what topics it addresses, and um, to understand why, in God's sovereignty, God actually put this book in the canon, why he inspired it and preserved it for us. And I, I hope um, you've been refreshed as we've been through this. We're almost through. And um, it's, uh, it's been a wonderful trip so far and what we've been able to be a part of. So tonight is Philemon. We get to look at the book together. This is an unassuming book. Can I just, can I just admit this? Like, it, it may get overlooked often <laughs> for a number of reasons. Number one, it's short. And I think, you know, that gets the short end of the stick. Um, it's only, like, I think 335 words in Greek. That's a pretty short letter for Paul, you know. John, maybe, but for Paul. Um, the circumstance that it addresses is also a very particular one and probably not one we find ourselves in directly, and so people may not think it's, it's immediately applicable, uh, particularly in our modern audiences. And, you know, another thing I realize is that it really doesn't contribute any new teaching, any new doctrine uh, to what other epistles have already said. In fact, there isn't any teaching proper at all in it. And so, um, for that reason, it's, it's easy to overlook it, but can I just appeal to you that this is a gem, and it is unique among the epistles that Paul have, has written. And so um, I get it, looking at those stats may not be the first choice for some people, um, but it is a, a remarkable and unique gem in the canon of Scripture with immense value. So a little background, uh, this letter was written by the Apostle Paul uh, while he was in prison, probably in Rome, in his first imprisonment in Rome around 60 to 62 A.D., um, and, and what's interesting about it is that this is a, you, this is a personal letter. Um, he wrote a lot of letters uh, that went to churches, and most of them were to teach something, as I mentioned, or to maybe in his, in, in his own defense of his ministry. Uh, maybe it was to refute false teaching. Uh, but this is a personal letter to a friend who lives in Colossae. In fact, to someone who he had led to Christ just a few years before this. And given the timing, it's likely that this letter was um, written at the same time as the, book, as the, the letter to the church in Colossae, uh, known as the book of Colossians. And so here we have two letters written by the same author, sent to the same place with two different purposes. And so we get to lean into what is special about that, um, being a personal letter. And that is one of the reasons I find this a compelling um, letter is, is just the personal nature of it. In this letter, rather than teaching on a topic, we actually get to see Paul step into a real world, challenging situation, and apply the doctrine that he teaches elsewhere, um, but in a humble and pastoral way, just apply it into this real world difficult circumstance. Uh, so what is the, the circumstance? What is the occasion? I'll give a summary of it. We're going to get a chance. This is a short enough book. We're going to read through the entire thing. But let me just give you, we'll work through it. I'll, I'll give you kind of just the, the summary of the circumstance because it's interesting. Many of the details about the occasion of this book are not given to us. Uh, we have pieces and we can put them together, 
Uh, but they're not all there. In fact, I, I found that a lot of the contextual clues that I would love to have about this were not given to us, and we have to kind of um, uh, guess. But nevertheless, what Paul is communicating is clear, and his doctrine is on full display, so we don't have to worry about the clarity of Scripture in this, even though we'd like more details here and there. But Paul is writing to Philemon, a friend who he led to Christ. Um, Philemon had grown in his faith after his conversion and had become a prominent member of the church Um, there in Colossae. And and in fact, we find in the beginning of this letter, he's actually hosting the church in his own home. So he has some amount of wealth to have a home uh, large enough to host the the church. I don't know what the size of it was at that point. Um, But in addition to that, he also owned a slave, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. But um, he owned a slave by the name of Onesimus. And at the writing of this letter, we find that Onesimus is in Rome with Paul. And um, (laughs) We're not actually, we're left to fill in the gaps as to how we got there, um, as to why, why he's away from his owner and why he's in Rome. But putting the pieces together, it seems that Onesimus has, has likely run away from his owner, uh, Philemon, and escaping to Rome a good distance uh, from Colossae, and, and it's large enough to get lost in. Um, here he is in Rome, and by God's sovereign design, Onesimus meets Paul. And through Paul's evangelism and his discipleship, Onesimus becomes a believer and um, is changed drastically from the inside out. So now as a brother in Christ, serving Paul um, together in fruitful gospel ministry while Paul is in chains, as he puts it, while he's in prison, uh, Onesimus became very dear to Paul, and Paul would have loved to have uh, kept him there to serve him. Um, But there's a problem that has to be resolved. Uh, and, and needs to be addressed. Onesimus had wronged his master, Philemon, um, and as a runaway slave, Onesimus is actually a criminal by law. And so this issue couldn't go unaddressed, and so what is the right thing to do? Um, in this culture, slaves were property. They could be sold, they could be exchanged, they could be purchased. Um, Runaway slaves were seen as among the lowest beings of society, actually. And if caught, many masters uh, would treat runaways severely and possibly even have them killed. They had the right to do that in this culture. Um, But this is the situation into which Paul steps into with pastoral care and biblical truth. It's a situation rife with... um, Uh, significant personal implications, social implications, moral implications, legal implications, implications for all those involved, including the church. So yes, uh, wouldn't you like to have an inside look at how Paul handles such a situation? Uh, What biblical convictions and truth drive him to counsel his friend the way that he does? And that's, that's the look that we get in this book, and that's what we get to walk through tonight. Uh, just a comment on slavery in this culture. I think we have to at least mention this. Um, it, it's a worthy study to figure out kind of what slavery looks like in the, in the ancient uh, Greco-Roman culture because there's a lot of it talked about in Scripture. Um, but we don't have time for all that tonight. Uh, suffice to say, though, um, slavery was a part of everyday life and was integrated to every level of society at this point. Um, And it's helpful to know that slavery in New Testament times doesn't directly equate with our our modern American uh, slavery that we're familiar with. There were a lot of similarities, and I certainly don't want to undercut that, but there were enough differences that we kind of have to deal with it on its own right as well. Um, But what what I think is is helpful to know is that... um, since Philemon is addressing a slave and a, uh, uh, the letter of Philemon, Paul is addressing a slave and a slave owner, it causes us to ask the question about what Scripture says about slavery. And I'll just summarize briefly. Um, while Scripture does have laws about, um, against man-stealing and other evil abuses against humanity that were really common with slavery, um, it, it's, and it does instruct how slaves and masters should, should live it's interesting that we find that New Testament writers never affirm or condone slavery as an institution, um, nor does it attack it and, and make it its you know, uh, task to fight it and change society's acceptance against it. 
What is the priority of the writers of Scripture is that we find that the inspired New Testament writers, such as Paul, give instruction about how to live within a society that has slaves and masters, um, and calling Christians themselves that may hold such positions to do so in a way that honors the Lord and, and doesn't sin against others. In other words, it's, it's, it's a reality of life that the New Testament writers instructed on how to live in as a Christian. Uh, and of course, such instruction was completely countercultural. Um, in a culture where slaves commonly resented masters and, and, and tried to shirk their work responsibilities, Paul called them to honor their masters and uh, work unto the Lord rather than unto, unto a man. Uh, where masters in a culture were found to tr- treat their slaves unfairly and harshly, cruelly, Paul called them to be reasonable, caring, and remember that uh, slave owners have a master that they are accountable of their own, and that uh, they will give an account. And so this in itself was completely countercultural, and they spent a lot of time shepherding people within a society where this was a normal part of life. Um, but uh, they spent their time shepherding Christians in whatever walk of life they were in. And in this case, uh, that slavery was, was part of those roles that were included among uh, marriage and, and, I mean, other walks of life. It just seemed like it was part of it to shepherd. So um, that's what we see here in Philemon. Onesimus is a slave. Paul doesn't argue that he should, should or should not be a slave. He just says, since you are a slave, this is how you walk with integrity before God. Uh, and he, we see he takes a similar tack with Philemon. So tonight... We're going to walk through Paul's letter to Philemon together, and in this letter, Paul's going to make a gracious appeal, uh, but rather firm appeal, I guess I should say, to Philemon to forgive Onesimus and reconcile his relationship with his runaway slave. And I want to encourage you, as we read through this, this letter is worth digging into on your own. Don't just take what, what we get through tonight, it's short but we're, we're, we're only going to look at one aspect of it. There are so many lessons that can be and should be gleaned from this letter. Lessons about reconciliation and forgiveness. Lessons from Paul's pastoral care in this situation. It's just masterful and caring. Um, lessons regarding the church and its role in, in how it helps. Uh, lessons about the gospel and transformation. But tonight, I want us to read this with a particular lens. Uh, tonight, we're going to look for a particular theme. So first, let's read this with an awareness that in their culture, Paul's appeal for reconciliation um, is, it would seem completely opposite of what is expected, completely countercultural. Um, it would seem completely unmerited. And for most, it would seem impossible in a complete lost cause. So just remember that this request is ludicrous. And in, on, on a number of letter, levels. And yet, despite of that, there's something that drives Paul to convictionally step into this difficult, inflammatory situation and advocate for reconciliation between Philemon and Onesimus. So something in Paul's heart drove him to put a high priority on reconciliation between these two men. And it gave him confident hope that reconciliation was even possible. So whatever that was that drove him, Um, it wasn't normal. It wasn't found in the culture. Uh, And he doesn't even say in this letter what it is that drives it. Why is that? Well, um, this is because he's already taught Philemon uh, what drives his appeal. He's already taught the church what drives his appeal. He's actually written about it in other letters. It's found in Scripture. He's he's, uh, confident and convicted because of the gospel. And they know this, and he's, they've, they've heard this from him. Um, here he's applying specific gospel realities and working out with conviction into this particular situation in real life. So what about us? Um, what's the lens for us as we read this? I, I don't expect that any one of us here is anywhere close to Philemon's specific situation, uh, needing to reconcile a relationship with a runaway slave. Um, but... Do you ever find yourself in a strained or broken relationship and wonder, Lord, how am I supposed to act? How am I supposed to see this? What, what's the priority here? Do you ever find yourself wondering whether you should try to reconcile a broken relationship or it's better just to kind of let bygones be bygones? Um, do you ever find yourself lacking hope that reconciliation is even possible? You know, if so, then I would suggest that we would benefit from being refreshed and strengthened uh, in the same gospel realities that drove Paul to make this appeal. 
to Philemon. So tonight, as we read it, I'm going to walk through this and we're going to highlight, I'm going to highlight five gospel realities that drive the believer's hope and priority for reconciliation. Um, I don't have them on the slides, and that's okay. If you want to write them down, I'll name them off as we go. But these are five gospel realities that drive the believer's hope and priority for reconciliation. So let's start reading. Uh, In verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Apphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I I tend to so quickly want to just say, okay, greeting, move on. Except there's so much here. First of all, can we just notice, Paul identifies himself as the author, right? But notice that unlike other epistles, um, Paul doesn't address himself as an authoritative apostolic position. He actually starts here in, in, an, in a humble position, identifying himself as a prisoner. And in fact, he doesn't even say a prisoner of Rome. He says, I'm a prisoner of Christ, Jesus. Um, his purpose here is to appeal to a friend as a brother. And he, so he doesn't start off with an authoritative position. He's not trying to say, thus saith the Lord in this regard. He's saying, this, this is my, this, I'm a friend. And this is how I want to appeal to you. Uh, look, let's look at um, who it's to. So it's to Philemon. Philemon's the primary recipient of the letter and, and addresses, um, and obviously this is addressing a personal matter specific to Philemon. So Paul calls him a beloved brother and a fellow worker. It's, you see, this is him putting himself on the same level, all right, pastorally. Um, I actually spent more time looking at the pastoral implications of this and I had to go back and kind of realize, wow, the gospel implications are what I really need to be dwelling on here. But it's so interesting. Um, he... He's establishing this brotherly connection with Philemon and Christ and the work of Christ rather than establishing his authority as an apostle. And, and uh, he's setting this humble, caring tone with Philemon. So, but notice it's a personal letter. It's addressing a personal matter. And, and Paul, in, but he includes others. Why does he say, um, hey, this is Paul uh, and Timothy? <laughs> um, he, he, Timothy's with him. And he's reading this and he's listening to it. And he, he also includes uh, who it's to. Instead of just to Philemon, he includes um, Apphia, um, Archippus, and the church. He's expecting that they're reading this. It's a personal letter. That puts a little bit of a different cast on what he's about to say. So some have speculated that Apphia and Philemon uh, may be Philemon's wife uh, and that Archippus could be his son. That, that could be. But whether they are or aren't, it's interesting that... Um, He's giving them titles that mean that they're probably prominent people in the church, and so that they could just be people in the church. Um, But Timothy, our brother, and then here's uh, Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier. Um, These are people who are part of the church, and then he has the whole rest of the church that is is, uh, meeting in his house. So while this is a personal letter, he's involving the church. Why? Well, I'll give you two reasons up front. Uh, First, it's clear that he seems that Paul seems to think this is an issue that involves the church or is at least irrelevant for the church and they should see or watch how this works out Uh, and that's what we're doing secondly probably for accountability and for help the church is an important part of living out paul's appeal and so he includes them expects this to be read and that they would hear this all laid out publicly verse four i thank my god always making mention of you in my prayers because i hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. There's that brother again. Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake... I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I'll stop there for a moment. Here we learn about Philemon's character, his faith in the Lord, um, and his love for the church, and his ministry that refreshes their hearts. Look, a, a few years before this, he just became a believer by Paul's testimony. And, and now it looks like 
His life is showing it in such a degree that Paul is confident of the gospel's work in his life. And so this is what gives him um, uh, this evidence of, of, the, of the transforming work of, of Christ. This is from the gospel. Um, we see faith and love for the Lord, which spills into love for the saints, which spills into serving the saints in ministry and love in a way that encourages and refreshes them. And, and it's just, it's a demonstrated love for the saints. So Paul is about to appeal. He says, I appeal to you um, to Philemon and, and to forgive and be reconciled to Onesimus, uh, which, as we said, was a radical proposal, right? Um, but the evidence of Philemon's belief in the gospel gives Paul a confident hope that Philemon will have the ability to forgive and to be reconciled to Onesimus and that he'll put a priority on it. So this highlights our first and most foundational gospel reality that drives Paul's hope for reconciliation. Number one, the gospel is ultimate reconciliation. So what is the gospel? The gospel is in, in, in reality... In the beginning, God, God, the perfect, holy, just God, created everything, and he created us. And when he did it, he, he created humans with his own image for a fellowship with him. And then we read in Genesis 3 that the humans cre- that he created rebelled against his authority and, and disobeyed, marring the very nature of humans with sinfulness, separating them from their holy God. And I know this is a familiar story for most of us, but just think of how close that is. And the kind of brokenness that happened after that and the kind of reconciliation necessary. And what's interesting is that it's our our holy God's goodness and his justice that caused him to promise to make all things right, to bring perfect justice. And you know what that means? That means to punish all evil. This means he would have to punish his special image bearers whom he loves. There is no way a person could ever pay this penalty. They would endure ongoing punishment, the wrath of a just God. And what's really heartbreaking about this condition, all the human race would suffer in eternity and never pay all of the wrath of God that is due. So God, but God, we love that phrase, but God, in his great love, made a way to save sinners, to reconcile them to himself. This is ultimate reconciliation. While we were still helplessly stuck in rebellious sin, God sent his son to be born as a man, to live a perfect sinless life and die as a perfect sinless man, a perfect sinless sacrifice as a payment for sin. And this man, Jesus, rose from the dead three days later, proving that he had defeated sin and death and proclaimed that any who would trust in him and his work for the forgiveness of sins would be forgiven of their sins and they'd be reconciled to God. Their broken relationship would be restored to glorious fellowship with their creator. You know, in the, in the book that he wrote along with this personal letter and sent to the, to the church of uh, to the Colossian church, he had described this in detail in Colossians 1, 22 and 22, uh, 21 and 22. He says, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil, evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death, in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Reconciliation is the heart of the gospel. Um, It is the ultimate reconciliation to the ultimate degree. So to experience this proves it's possible. Um, It's the most, even the most extreme circumstances is possible. So for those who experience this ultimate reconciliation, Paul has taught this He's taught it in, in multiple books that they probably passed these letters around, but specifically to, Col- to the Colossians. Um, and, and then he also preaches that those who have experienced this are given the ministry and the priority of reconciliation. To non-believers, uh, we, we, we get to read in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, Paul wrote this, this very thing. And all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely That God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, and he has committed us to the word of reconciliation. For those who are not right with God, our hope to be reconciled to them is that they would be reconciled to a holy God. The ultimate reconciliation, he's given us that ministry. You know, and as believers, we have the same thing. We are given the priority of reconciliation with each other. It was in Matthew 5, 
23 and 24, and Jesus himself taught that the high priority of a, of a right relationship with each other should, should be right there. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother. Then come and present your offering. That's a, that's a priority. If I've, if I've experienced ultimate reconciliation, <laughs> We should put a priority on that. Um, you know, he, he also wrote it to the Colossian church, Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Uh, so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you. So should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. They've heard this before. So the gospel reconciles us to God. Showing us ultimate reconciliation proves to us and gives us hope that the others uh, that others can be reconciled to God and that uh, we can be reconciled to each other even in the most difficult circumstances. And it puts a priority on it. So back to Philemon. Here we are in this letter to Philemon. We we see Paul's confident hope for reconciliation between Philemon and Onesimus. And where does this come from? It's coming from the gospel. And he has a, a confident hope that Philemon will be able to forgive and reconcile because he sees the fruit of the gospel in his life. So he doesn't, he, you know, and it's funny, he, this is why he's being humble. This is why he doesn't have to pull rank. He's already confessed, look, I see all this fruit in your life. All I got to do is remind you what's real. And as a brother, I don't have to pull up apostolic rank. So because he has confident hope in Philemon's tenderness to the gospel, uh, which he teaches and that, that, you know, he prioritizes, that he will prioritize and be reconciled uh, with Onesimus. Let's look at verse 10. Um, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful to both you and to me. I've sent him back to you in person, that is, sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me, so that on your behalf, he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. He's actually giving him credit. Uh, We'll come back to this for a second. Let's keep reading. But without your consent, I didn't want to do anything so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but by your own free will. Perhaps he was for this very reason separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave. As a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? So much we could unpack here, but let's just start here. Paul informs Philemon, first and foremost, that he's now a brother in Christ. That he's come to Christ, he sees fruit in his life. And this changes the equation significantly for reconciliation, doesn't it? The man that gave Philemon a difficult time and ran away and left him, defrauding him of his service, is not the same man returning. Both Paul and Philemon understand the reality that is number two in our list here, that the gospel transforms the believer. The gospel transforms the believer. That's the reality, the gospel reality that's giving hope and priority to it here. So a person in Christ is not only justified, uh, forgiven, and reconciled to God, but he's made into a new creation. We're familiar with 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Isn't that true of Philemon here? Look at this description. Um, The inward reality of this transformation bears fruit outwardly, and, and we see this. Look, in verse 11, Paul says, he was useless to you, and now he's useful. You know, he's making a a play on words. Onesimus' name actually means useful. And so here he is saying, he was useless. Well, a a runaway slave is useless. He can't use one. And now he is actually returned and he's proven useful in gospel ministry and his service of the saints, just like Philemon. That's useful. Look at verse 12. He's gone from disobedient to obedient. He had run away, disobedient to his master, and now the new Onesimus is obediently submitting to the Lord's will by returning to submit himself obediently um, to Philemon, despite the risk and potential consequences. So consider how radical this idea is. Completely countercultural, right? As a runaway slave, he's considered a criminal, lowest kind of person there is in society, and he could be severely punished. 
And things are very good for both Onesimus and Paul, just as they are. Uh, at first blush, Onesimus has um, much to lose and a high chance of losing it. So why leave? Why go? Well, Onesimus is transformed. He's a new man. It makes, it makes it all different. He's broken the law, morality, uh, just from a, he was morally defrauded his master. He must submit himself to be obedient to the Lord. So guess what? He's taking steps to walk in repentance. He's been made right with God, and now he's got to prioritize being made right with Philemon, who he has wronged. So he will return, seek to reconcile his relationship with his owner, even at great risk to himself. Look at verse 12. I've sent him back to you in person. That is, sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without your consent, I will not do anything so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but of your own free will. Just a note again on Paul's pastoral graciousness. The new Onesimus has served Paul so well that it's almost as if his friend Philemon had sent his own servant to serve Paul in, in his prison, in imprisonment. But he knows that's not the reality. Um, Paul, too, is making a significant personal sacrifice to send Onesimus back. But to keep him here would uh, not address the wrong, and it would be taking advantage of the situation, which, though advantageous, would deprive Philemon of reconciliation and the fellowship of this new Onesimus and also deprive him of the opportunity for Philemon to participate in ministry by putting Onesimus to service himself in gospel ministry. So Paul sends him back, prioritizing the good of Philemon and Onesimus and the watching church as they see, oh, we need to receive this man back. In verse 15 and 16, we see more transformation of Onesimus. Um, for perhaps it was for this reason, he says, that he was separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave. A beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and of the Lord. This is great. Uh, Paul is pastorally um, attributing the circumstances to God's sovereign goodwill. Paul helps Philemon see that this is speaking truth to yourself, right? To your heart. He's helping him see the, the marvel of God using this difficulty for a beautifully redemptive um, and, and restorative purpose. So he was temporarily a slave, and now he's a beloved brother in Christ. And I, and, I, and I take this in two ways, by the way. Part of it is the transformation that happened. Verse 16, more than a slave, more than a beloved brother. And even in verse 12, when Paul says Onesimus has become very dear to Paul, very, his very heart, Paul's testifying that Onesimus has actually become the kind of person that Philemon will deeply appreciate because of his transformation in Christ. Enjoy fellowship, enjoy fellowship in the ministry. This speaks of that transformation from old to new. And that is quite remarkable. But this statement also highlights another key reality of the gospel that drives and shapes Paul's shepherding of this situation. In this statement, Paul is also affirming that Onesimus, though he is a slave in this world, has a new position in Christ beloved brother. So this is an incredible statement for a number of reasons. First, notice that this coincides with the titles that Paul gave um, Timothy at the beginning, Aphia as a sister, uh, Philemon himself as a brother. So Paul is compelled to draw Onesimus into the sibling terminology. And how completely counter is that to what's expected? Paul puts a criminal, runaway slave, one of the lowest positions in society, in, into the same category as Timothy, Aphia, Philemon, and then in a moment, even himself. Why? Reality number three, the gospel establishes the believer's position. The gospel establishes the believer's true position, a position in the household of God. Paul, listen to how he taught this gospel reality, speaking of the believer in Christ in, in Ephesians chapter two. That, that whole section is just so relevant to this. Just read that in parallel to this, this book right here, this letter. But in 2.19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. He says it to Col the Colossians as well, giving thanks to the Father who, is who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. 
Uh, Romans 8, we're familiar with, you have received a spirit of adoption as sons. See the sibling, uh, the importance of that sibling uh, position here? Adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. This is how Paul taught the churches of Ephesus, Rome, and Colossae. Those who have saving faith in Christ are adopted into the kingdom of God as sons and daughters, and not just some lesser child who gets to sit at the end of the table, but because of these believers being united in Christ together, they're heirs, heirs to the kingdom with with, with Christ. The gospel establishes the believer in a new position they didn't have before, an honored position in the household of God, and Paul knows this reality. And he works it out into this circumstance, helping Philemon and the church at Colossae to work this out and see it as well. Given that the believer is transformed and in his new position, Paul shows us that these realities have got to work out in how we see and interact with each other before we try to go after something like reconciliation, which makes no sense in most of the relationships in this world and the way that the world looks at justice. This recategorization is necessary by gospel realities that supersede what we would have in our culture. Verses 16 and 17, look at, look at him drive this home. No longer as a slave, we're just repeating that, but, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord, if you regard me a partner, accept him as you would me. This is Paul working out this reality that just supersedes everything in the real world. Onesimus, still a runaway slave, Paul doesn't negate this, United in Christ as a brother in the household and an heir heir with Christ. And the result, he works it out to Philemon. Given Onesimus' new transformation position, receive him back. No longer as a slave, but as a beloved brother. Accept him as you would me, the Apostle Paul. So I, I break this out separately, but the next reality that I just wanted to show, not only is that position defined and established in the gospel, but the gospel redefines the believer's relationships. Just categorically, you can't put a person from position of lowly slave who ran away and is a criminal to heir of the kingdom without that changing the relationship. The gospel redefines the believer's relationships entirely. Galatians 3, 26 through 28 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For, you are, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Now listen, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is the household of God he's speaking about. This is the adoption he's speaking about. This is the new position he's speaking about. He's not saying you aren't a slave because there's no distinction. That'd be like saying there's no such thing as male and female because there's no distinction. He's just saying, I know you're a slave, but you know what supersedes that? You've closed yourself in Christ and you have a new position in the kingdom of God. Philemon, you've got to know this about Onesimus because this changes your reconciliation. He says a similar thing to the Colossians. Colossians 3, 10 and 11. That, that's a rich section in there about this. And have, when you have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, bar- barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man. But Christ is all and in all. Look, whatever position we hold in this world, the position given to a believer in the household of God supersedes all others. And this is a reality that is so clear in Paul's thinking. And it restructures what reconciliation looks like. It's a powerful reality. It puts the lowly slave into the same category as the Apostle Paul. And when we understand this reality, the gospel fundamentally changes our relationships, causes us to correctly understand that relationship with each other, gives us a correct premises, uh, premise on which to be reconciled. So do you see the difference? How would Philemon Onesimus be reconciled to their role uh, if, if their role was master and runaway slave? They wouldn't. What if they left it as how the culture defines that? They wouldn't. It has to be redefined. But when they're called to accept Onesimus as a beloved brother, fellow heir in Christ, with the same father, now what does reconciliation look like? The gospel reality must be in front and center of our minds as we look to make things right between a brother and a sister. Let's look at verse 18 through 21. But if he has wronged you in any way, Paul says, 
or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention to you that you owe to me even your own self as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. So from Onesimus' testimony to Paul, when he became a believer and he's saying, well, this is where I was and now this, and you know when people share their testimony, one of the things that's amazing, it's not the light switch moment, it's, it's what's happened since then. What do you see the difference from before to now? And that's our testimony. And in, in Onesimus' testimony to Paul, he evidently confessed that he... Um, <laughs> He has defrauded his, his master. Maybe he stole from him. Maybe he's just depriving him from his services. But whatever it is, there seems to be something that Paul is aware of. And he's speaking gently about it, isn't he? But there seems to be something he's aware of that he has wronged and probably needs to be paid back. Restitution is probably expected to make things right. Look, um, Onesimus on his own merit doesn't, for, doesn't deserve forgiveness or mercy. But Paul knows as a forgiven believer, this is exactly what Philemon should offer. How could a person who's been forgiven an unpayable debt refuse to forgive an offense? That's exactly the lesson that Jesus teaches in the parable in Matthew 18, 21 through 25 of the the slave who had such a massive debt and he asked for, for mercy and the master forgave him the entire debt that he could never repay. And then, of course, he turned around and demanded that a small debt be repaid back to him and showed no mercy to a slave. The Lord made it clear this can't be. A person who has been forgiven much should be able to forgive in return. Remember that you've been forgiven much. And that's what he says here. Look, remember, I, I was instrumental in bringing you to Christ. You owe your eternity to this brother. And so I'm asking you to put it on my account. I've got some clout. You know, it's funny. He doesn't pull apostolic card yet. He's still not pulling rank. Speaking with authority of God. He's pulling the brother card and the you owe me card. That's just gracious. But this is, this is a reality number five. The gospel pays the believers deeper grievances. I worded it that way because this flips the coin. This is the person who's the one who's been wronged. If that's you, just remember the gospel pays the the believer's deeper grievances. When you're the one who's been wronged, does this stand in the way of your willingness to reconcile with a brother or sister in Christ? Do you demand that recompense be made? Maybe even that they confess it and forgive it before, you know, and, and they grovel before you do so, or maybe they have to pay it back. But in this case, Paul is saying, no, I, I'm asking you, as a brother who's also been forgiven much and knows that so have you because I led you to that truth. Forgive him. Charge it to my account. You know, it's not, it's not foreign in the, in the Christian world to, for a, look at, he's actually playing this in a small sense, what Christ did for him. Christ took our, our sin He said, charge it to my account. Paul's using that here graciously as a brother. Look, if you would forgive me of these things because you love me, forgive him and just charge it to me. And if it's actually owed, I'll even pay it back. He even says, you know, I'm I'm writing this in my own hands. You know, I'll pay it back. But he's, he's betting on the reality. The gospel pays the deeper, the believer's deeper grievances. Reconciliation is to be a higher priority than ensuring that restitution has been fully executed. In fact, you know, it's interesting um, when Paul was talking to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, they're talking about why, why are you taking each other to court? Trying to, trying to like make everything right, tit for tat, right for wrong, you know, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. It's why, not, why not just re- rather be wronged? Be wronged. You've been given so much grace for the testimony of the Lord and of the gospel. And, and that's, he, he, this is the same Paul talking here. Again, look at his care here. Um, he's just, Paul led Philemon to the Lord, and as such, he's in one sense, he'll forever be thankful for Paul's redemptive care of his soul. Of course, he'd be willing to forgive this. 
And then he lands that, having confidence in your obedience. I'm confident you're going to be obedient in this because I already see fruit of the gospel in your life. I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. You know, there's a hint here, more than a hint. Paul's not saying, look, I want you to free Onesimus. I I want you to make him a free man. But he's saying, look, now that you know this, and I know Philemon, I know how tender your heart is to the gospel, and you already know these realities. So I'm betting on the fact this changes everything for you too. I'm betting you're going to want him in, in service of the Lord as I've already testified that he is effective for ministry in the gospel. So I know that you're not only going to reconcile with him, oh, you're going to do more than that. I, I wonder, we don't have a re- an account of what Philemon did. I hope out of joy, he at least put Onesimus to service for the eternal kingdom work that was going on right there. Maybe even sent him back to serve Paul. Maybe that's what he was hinting at. Or maybe he freed him. You know, that was one of the big differences that I found out about slavery in their time versus their, this time uh, in, in America in a modern setting. A, there was no racism involved here. There was every race uh, was, was made a slave at some point. No one ever associated that with racism. Um, the other thing is, is that freedom was always, a, was always a possibility. They always talked about, I mean, there, there was always this... Um, Hope of, of, well, maybe I can buy my freedom. Maybe I can earn my freedom back. And that's just not something that we think about in, in the slavery context that we have here. But here, um, that was always a possibility. And uh, it was not uncommon. Um, and sometimes the, the slaves were freed and they, they refused it because they would rather bond themselves to their, their, the home that they served because they thought it was such a great situation where they loved the, the family so much. But in this case, Paul's saying, I, you'll do more. You have the ability, and I'm looking forward to see what that is. Um, Confident in your obedience, I write to you, since I know that you will do even more than what I say. All couched in the gospel realities that without, none of this would make sense. Let's finish this. Uh, Verse 22, at the same time, also prepare me a lodging. I hope that through your prayers, I will be given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark. Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, and my fellow workers, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, or be with your spirit. Again, it's a personal letter from Paul to Philemon. I just find it remarkable. This says a lot, and you can go through this, and you can look at the the theme of the church in this and why they're included. But imagine that Onesimus didn't just return to Philemon. he He returned to the house. Onesimus used to serve in the house where the church meets. The church is an integral part of receiving him back. And Paul does a number of things to provide some accountability. He's confident in Philemon doing the right thing, and yet at the same time he's like, I'm providing some accountability here. I want you all to know this is what the gospel does. This is what is expected, and this is what I, Paul, am am appealing to you as a brother to do with Onesimus, reconcile, put him to use. And church, I need you to know that's the right thing to do. Watch this. Watch this work out. It makes no sense in our culture. Reconciliation is possible when the culture says they shouldn't. It's not merited. It's a lost cause. It's unwise, whatever. Watch this. Do it. Accept him back. Um, And so he includes a host of people on his end to hear what's going on and on their end to hear what's going on. So there's a fellowship of this and there's an accountability. And if that wasn't enough accountability, he says, by the way, I'm coming. I'm going to see what happened. Prepare a lodging for me. Um, part of this is, is also just, it's not, it's not a, a power play. Part of this is also, look at this. He's like, prepare for me a lodging for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. He's shown, I'm in, I'm in ministry with you, brother. You're in ministry with me. We are partners in ministry. That's the fellowship of ministry that he talked about earlier that he continues to pray would be effective. Oh, this is a partnership. A koinonia, as he put it. uh, Fellowship and a partnership. And he's showing that here. Keep praying for me. I think he had some confidence that, you know, the case against him was pretty weak. He'd be released. Um, He and Epaphras, my fellow prisoner. um, And he said, you know, I'm coming. I want to stay with you, and I want to see the result of this. I think it was out of joy, but I know that if there was any doubt in anyone's mind as to whether or not they were going to do what was right, they knew that Paul would be coming as well. You see how confident 
Paul is that this is the right thing to do and it will happen. And I'm including accountability of the church and they're going to participate in it to make sure that this thing that is otherwise not likely is going to happen. And if, and if it doesn't, I'm going to be coming anyway. I can follow up with you. Um, so he, he applies a little bit of pressure there, but ultimately I think this is a joy uh, in ministry. There are so many other elements of this book. That's the end of the book. He ends with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you or be with your spirit, actually, um, in the NASB. And, you know, this is a common ending, a common um, salutation at the end, a benediction. Um, but again, as we know, Paul and his theology and, and the gospel, um, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ being with your spirit is no small matter, and it is the basis on which all of this is. So, Five gospel realities that drive the believer's hope and priority for reconciliation. The gospel is the ultimate reconciliation. The gospel transforms the believer inside out. The gospel defines the believer's position. The gospel redefines the believer's relationships. And the gospel pays the believer's deeper grievances. In our culture and in our own hearts even, justice and reconciliation seem unreasonable often far off, even impossible. But the gospel completely changes that. These realities in particular point out why. It's a completely different structure, a different paradigm. The gospel proves it's possible. The the gospel gives us hope of reconciliation and it gives us the ministry and the priority of reconciliation. If the person you're not reconciled with isn't a believer, your hope is God in Christ on the cross. Share it. Pray. There were people in our own family that we were not reconciled with and we had difficult relationships. 25 years of prayer. And that person became a believer. And we are not only reconciled, but we have fellowship. Just like Paul was hoping with Philemon and and Onesimus. Uh, That's your hope. Um, If there's a believer in your life that you have an estranged relationship with or that you're just kind of saying, let's let let some bygones be bygones and we're just going to like stay apart. There's something wrong with that. The gospel that saved you doesn't allow for that. It redefines the whole premise that you have this relationship and why you're close and under the same authority of God the Father in the household and the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the grace necessary for that. And he puts a priority on it. He tells you to have a priority on it. I don't know if that cuts you the way it cuts me, but this has been quite a week. Uh, It's a couple weeks studying this. And um, it teaches a lot about the hope of reconciliation, forgiveness, and the priority of it. And I hope that it's an encouragement to you and that we can continue to fellowship in these things. Let me close in prayer. Father, I thank you for the faithfulness of Paul to work out doctrine without hesitation. (laughs) This is so bold for him to take these realities and map them onto this very touchy situation that most people would take another tack. They wouldn't even request this. They would take other approaches. I'm I'm certain of it. But with the reality of your gospel at at play, Lord, us too, we, we can see. We can see the priority that we are given for reconciliation. We can see the means of reconciliation. We can see the grace of reconciliation. And and I pray that um, that would affect us and that here at Grace Bible Church, reconciliation and and forgiveness would be quick on our lips and that we would have a paradigm to work from that that is like Paul's, that he has demonstrated here. I thank you for his care to step in between these two men that from the social position and and just the culture, uh, this would be a really sad ending. But he stepped in. And um, Lord, I pray that we would also be willing to step in and help encourage people have the right perspective, the gospel realities shaping those conversations. Encourage us. We're thankful for the reconciliation that we have in Christ. Help us to celebrate that, particularly in this Easter season as, as we are here upon uh, Resurrection Sunday next week and Good Friday coming and and just uh, preparing our hearts for that. We owe you everything and could never repay it. And so we just worship.
find our place at a place of worship. Thank you for this evening and the fellowship that we have together in Jesus' name. Amen.